spanning close to 800,000 square kilometers and bordered by Tanzania, Malawi and South Africa, the Southeast African country is home to some 23 million people. Although classified as a dual economy, the agricultural sector is the biggest contributor to GDP and employs 80% of the working population. Over the past few years, Mozambique has managed to maintain a GDP growth of over 7%. In 2011, the country registered a 7.2% increase and 7.5% is forecast for 2012. This will be underpinned by robust investment inflows into large projects such as coal mining and gas. Belgium, Italy and South Africa are Mozambique's major export partners with aluminium, cotton and timber, while machinery, fuel and chemicals are imported from trade partners South Africa, China and Australia. Mozambique has embarked on a number of fiscal reforms, however the country still remains heavily dependent on foreign assistance, with the United States being its largest donor. Bilateral trade between the two countries is said to have risen by 68% in 2011 alone, reaching over 487 million US dollars. Although the withdrawal of donor funds still remains a risk, and a global economic slowdown may weigh down exports, the government's attempts at increasing transparency, rehabilitating infrastructure and attracting foreign direct investment should have a positive impact on the Mozambican economy. Johannesburg. Now joining me in studio to take a closer look at Mozambique as a business and investment destination is Faisal Musa. He's head of project and infrastructure finance at Investec South Africa and John Faraz, who's a director at ENS in the projects and project finance department. Thanks so much. Uh, Gentlemen, for joining me today, let's perhaps, John, uh, start off with you. I mean, the year 2011 may well be remembered as a turning point in Mozambique's economy, marking the birth of Mozambique as an exporter of uh, minerals with its first export of coal specifically. From your perspective, what's the status that Mozambique holds on the investor radar screen right now? I think right now it's, uh, Mozambique and probably its neighbor, Tanzania, probably represent the two primary investment destinations, particularly on the eastern seaboard. Um, recent discoveries of um, large quantities of gas, um, as well as the coal uh, discoveries in the Motis, um coal field have created a number of opportunities. They've also created some regulatory and other challenges for the government. Um, but certainly um, it has put Mozambique very much on the radar and has created a hell of a lot of attention from investors and from um, the region itself. When it comes to research around uh, Mozambique's investment case and researching in that regard, it's interesting the kind of articles that come up in the commentary that uh, surrounds uh, Mozambique right now, Faisal. Uh, some of the commentary has been that Mozambique has a very strong hand right now. Is that a perspective you share? Yes, it is. We've seen an incredible increase in business activity and investor interest over the past four or so years. Um, driven by the coal fines and uh, most recently by the gas fines and the presence of a number of large companies. So you've got um, companies like Anadarko Valley, um, a number of multinationals um, participating in the sector. And I think uh, Mozambique is probably primed for an incredible increase in both FDI activity, mm -hmm. exports um, and generally investor interest. Well, that growth story has certainly been phenomenal. Over the past decade, we've seen growth out of Mozambique average 7.2%, growth expected to hit 7.5% this year and then 7.9% next year. But a lot of that as a result of continued FDI inflows, John, mostly in extractive industries, you know, your capital intensive projects in the extractive industries. Just how dangerous a territory does this leave Mozambique in? I think in many ways, Mozambique hasn't suffered from the same let's call it the so-called resource curse that other countries have suffered and as a result they are approaching these developments with a lot more caution they are consulting broadly um, on the gas side the government is presently uh, reviewing all of the regulations and the regulatory framework that will govern exploration and production and they've also brought into operation a law came into operation on the in August 2011 mm -hmm. which opens up the space for PPPs and large scale projects to be undertaken in a more structured way. So I think they're alive to the challenges, they're alive to the requirement that socio-economic 
investment needs to accompany foreign direct investment. They're certainly alive to local content and employment issues. Um, and on the one hand, they need to strike a balance between creating an investor-friendly environment that will allow large investors to, to take the kind of capital risks which they need to take and at the same time manage expectations of Mozambicans. Yeah, just how well are they managing to carve this route out, uh, you know, from a government perspective, from a regulatory perspective in Mozambique, so that this environment is enticing for investors and that uh, pr presents a case where Mozambique is in fact open for business? Well, I think the regulatory um, component of the discussion um, it, uh, is, it's, it's still early stages. They still got a, a way to go in terms of their regulations. But what has been very positive is um, that there's always been policy continuity experience. So over the past decade, they've had the same set of policies towards um, capital markets, towards investment, um, and towards business. Mm -hmm. And while the regulations and the legislation may not have followed as quickly, there hasn't been uncertainty as to the policy direction of government. Mm -hmm. And that has provided a, a, a decent amount of certainty to investors. Yeah, taking a look at the investment hotspots that are cropping up outside of the resources space and the commodity story, uh, what's actually getting attention out there? Three things. Um, agriculture has always attracted attention mm -hmm. because it is a country that's not water constrained. Um, and it has a great agricultural potential still. Um, and you do find a few agricultural majors, particularly from South Africa in the sugar sector out there. Um, but the most recent hotspots have been uh, coal and gas. Mm -hmm. um, and gas, um, I would say the third one being power. Yeah. Uh, they've got an incredible hydro potential. Um, they could effectively be the powerhouse of Southern Africa. Um, and related to that is coal, which then fuels power generation as well, in addition to exports, and gas, which fuels power generation in addition to exports. Mm -hmm. So I would say coal, gas, and power are the hotspots in Mozambique at the moment. Agriculture was also highlighted as a, an investment hotspot there, and from a regulatory perspective, I mean, foreign investment and foreign investors generally receive uh, the same treatment as uh, you know domestic in investors, but some restrictions remain, and I've been reading that private ownership of land is restricted, and then mining and management contracts are subject to specific performance requirements as well. When it comes to that land ownership restriction, is that warranted or a hindrance uh, to an investment case, especially if you are looking at a sector like agriculture and working to develop that space moving forward? I think it's, it's, very, it's very true. Um, land ownership, land rights have been a concern for foreign investors. It is part of the overall model, if you like, economic model of the state, which provides for all land to vest in the state. And as a result, large investments, even agricultural developments, need to be undertaken generally on the basis of long leases. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a formal legal system that governs the registration of those leases and there is security of tenure, but there is always the concern, natural concern for investors that uh, they prefer the security of direct ownership as opposed to indirect uh, property rights by means of long leases. Mm -hmm. uh, taking a look at uh, you know, the uh, medium term economic structural challenge of actually broadening that fiscal base that I uh, kind, uh, kind of alluded to with Faisal there when we're looking at other investment hotspots in the economy, what else can be done or should be done to promote the diversification of Mozambique's revenue base? In many ways I think Mozambique is facing a chicken and egg uh, type of dilemma. On the one hand, there is uh, ailing infrastructure um, and inadequate access to rail and port infrastructure in particular, which are necessary enablers for exports of coal um, and in future potential exports of, of LNG. Um, so that, that creates a significant challenge. On the one hand, the government needs to undertake some investment in that area. On the other hand, I think they need to link the necessary investment in those areas to incoming investment from willing third parties who are willing to participate in those extractive industries. Um, it ordinarily, entities that invest in those extractive industries have bring about those developments themselves. So where roads, schools, training colleges, etc., are required, 
the large investors will typically take that on themselves, as we've seen even in South Africa with yeah. cities and towns like uh, Sasselberg and Secunda, which literally have flourished around the petrochemical industry. And the same thing is likely to happen in Mozambique, provided that the environment is created for that, that level of investment. On the port side, we've seen over the last couple of years some participation of the private sector with significant improvements in throughput at port terminals and in port operations. And there has, um, I think in defense of the Mozambican government, there has been a fair openness to inward investment and to private sector participation in infrastructure uh, projects and in infrastructure operation. There have also been some failures. Uh, rail concessions, for example, like the Senna concession mm -hmm. was, a, was, a, was a wholesale failure for the government and I think it's caused them to go back and relook at the role of CFM, for example, as a state entity. There are capacity issues, um, particularly as regards human resources, level of skill, training, knowledge, etc., which do pose a significant risk and the ability of the state to actually manage contracts that they enter into. In other words, contract management capability is another area that needs That's some exactly growth. it, because while we've got government, you know, uh, ambitious when it comes to its infrastructure investment plan and, uh, you know, expenditure happening, uh, and to an extent working to entice a private sector, I mean, you've got a question just what kind of approach private sector has to doing business with any African government and that off Mozambique no different as well. I mean, uh, we're speaking to construction companies here in South Africa on a regular basis, uh, Faisal, they say that they tend to shy away from government work and opt solely for private sector work. Uh, is that a missed opportunity uh, on the private sector basis or accurate enough assessment of the risk profile from that investor perspective? Well, what we've experienced in over the past five years, we've been developing a project in Mozambique for about five years now, a, a particular project, is that they do have a uh, very competitive incentive package mm -hmm. for capital investments and for foreign di direct investment. Um, however, there is a distinct gap in terms of education, skills, and training in the country. Um, now, to the extent that they would seek to have investment in beneficiation in the country, the way to uh, foster that would actually be to focus on education, skills, and training. Because I think what you would find is that the major investors would be looking for a labor force mm -hmm. and a skilled workforce that they would be able to employ in beneficiation as opposed to extraction. Absolutely. Um, and, and we've seen that as a reasonable, as, as quite a large gap. And I think the South African and other construction firms who participate in that sector the challenge they face there is that they're dealing with a very small professional class. And as a result, they would prefer to do things as a private sector only because there's a bit of a gap in terms of skills and capacity. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Okay, well, let's leave the conversation there for now. We're heading into a quick commercial break, but there's more on Invest Africa when we return. And the spotlight today, of course, when it comes to investing in Africa, turns to beneficiation within the resources space specifically and how that can work to enhance economic growth in Mozambique. Stay tuned.